On May 20th, 2021, Newsroom released publicly that 14 days earlier, on May 6, 2021, accomplished manga author Kentaro Miura had passed away due to aortic dissection at age 54. This was a shock to so many in the world of manga, with various artists and fans offering their condolences to someone who is so influential in not only the world of manga, but fantasy media as a whole. This unexpected and unfortunate event would, following the release of a final chapter in the 2021 18th issue of Young Animal on September 10th, finally bring Berserk's 32 year and 41 volume run to a close. After over 30 years and more than 50 million copies sold, Berserk, along with Miro, would finally be put to rest, putting an end to what had become not only one of the most legendary manga of all time, but one of the most famous dark fantasy series worldwide, and a work that had touched so many people around the world with its complex characters, morals, themes, and beautiful artwork. It's incredibly evident in many series the influence that Muira and his work has had. It's a story that, going into it, I don't think I expected to necessarily connect with it as much as I feel that I did. It has the outward appearance of this crude, dark gore fest, but once I actually started diving into Muira's world, I realized how much more it was than that. Ask anyone who's read Berserk what their favorite part of the series was, and while its beautifully drawn battles are what I believe to be a huge part of its success, most people I've heard answer that question tend to talk about the more quiet moments. It's Guts lying down in the rain after losing so many people important to him, the many conversations between Guts and the other characters about why they live, their dreams. There are so many beautiful and introspective moments that really make you stop and think. And Going into the manga, I just knew it was about this guy with the big sword. That was not necessarily the first thing I was expecting. And that doesn't even get me started on what I thought was such a beautiful depiction of trauma and its main protagonist, which is something that I'd like to write about at some point. However, Guts is not the main focus of this video. Instead, today I'd like to take time to speak about his counterpart, the leader of the infamous Band of the Hawk, Griffith. Having freshly finished the latter, I'd like to speak on his portrayal throughout Berserk's Black Swordsman and Golden Age arcs, and how his portrayal from the beginning to the end of these arcs sets us up for what would happen at the end of the Golden Age arc during the Eclipse, and the emotions that Muir wanted us to feel alongside his characters. One more real quick thing before we get started, this part is not scripted, but I figured I should probably throw it in. Along with the territory, this video does discuss some pretty heavy stuff when it comes to sexual assault, so I'll give another warning before we, we kind of really get into that, but if that's something you're not into, you know, just be on the lookout for that, be ready for that. Um, so yeah, let's get into it. The first thing I'd like to speak on is Griffith's initial appearance. From the beginning, I thought it was a very interesting choice by Muir to start Berserk with an aged guts for a few chapters for his first arc, and then travel back to explain his origin and past with the Band of the Hawk. If I had to guess, I would say a big part of it was so that he could catch the reader's attention from the beginning and give them a better expectation as to what the series would be about, rather than just starting with the child guts and getting immediately into the darker subject matter that comes along with his childhood. I also think that starting with an aged guts rather than immediately jumping to the time period where we would spend the bulk of the Golden Age arc has another purpose, that being establishing Griffith's character, or rather what his character would become. Though it might seem kind of strange to spoil Griffith's betrayal so early in the story before it would occur naturally, I think that it ends up creating a really interesting dynamic with how heavily his initial appearance contrasts his real introduction into the story, but I'll speak more on that when we get there. How about Griffith's real introduction in the start of the Golden Age arc? Straight off the bat, Griffith is established as someone who is respected and revered by those around him, and it's not all talk either, being that he's the first person to really put a stop to Guts' victory streak since leaving behind his old life. Griffith's reputation is backed up in very apparent skill. I'd like to take a look at Griffith and Guts' first fight for a bit, as this being their first real encounter, I think right off the bat it says a lot about their relationship and what it would become. From the beginning, I think it's very apparent that Griffith acts as a sort of foil character to Guts, from bigger things like their general personality to little details in the way that they fight. Take a look at Guts' portrayal throughout the early Golden Age arc. He's incredibly angry and aggressive in his fighting style and facial expressions. Now, look at how Griffith fights in their initial battle. He's elegant, he's graceful, and you get the feeling that each one of his moves is carefully planned out. Even in the way that their characters are designed, we see a clear contrast in the general ideas. Guts is portrayed as very masculine. He has short, black, spiky hair and carries around with him his iconic giant sword, which is more akin to just a large chunk of iron. Now, take a look at Griffith's design and portrayal with his introduction. He has much more feminine facial features and long white hair, and even his weapon is in opposition to Guts, having a long, thin blade and matching his elegant appearance. Now that I've talked a bit about his immediate contrast against Guts, and while we're on the topic of his appearance, I'd like to talk about the framing in a lot of these panels and how Griffith is drawn. 
Straight from his introduction, something that I noticed while reading is that it's very often that Griffith will be put above those around him, and I don't mean that in the sense that he's revered by those under him in the Band of the Hawk, because while that's true, I mean it in a more literal sense. Besides from through his skill and reputation, Muir often makes you literally look up to Griffith. As a result of the mix of framing in a lot of these shots, and Griffith being portrayed with more feminine and delicate features, he often comes off almost like an angel in these shots, and I think that's exactly what Muir was going for. Whether it be through more subtle methods like his shot composition, or more overt methods like making him up to this point in the story the most skilled swordsman, Muir, in my opinion at least, really succeeds in making Griffith exceedingly likable. He's beautiful, he's charismatic, he's skilled, and he's everything we want in a leader. You come to see him, Guts, Casca, and the rest of the Band of the Hawk grow and change, not only as a group but as people. Griffith serves as a guardian angel for those in the Band of the Hawk. He gives many of them a reason to live. He lets them feed off his dream of going from nothing to everything. Even you, the reader, begins to fall under his charismatic spell, which makes it really easy to continue to begin to forget the cruel and inhuman monster that we are shown he would eventually become. You begin to wonder how the carefree young leader of the Band of the Hawk could become the vile monster that you're shown earlier in the Black Swordsman arc. Your mind begins to wander as you fall in love with these characters and their relationships, and you watch Guts and Griffith form a closer and closer bond, but in the back of your mind there's always that nagging knowledge that it's all a farce, and that it all eventually must come to an end. Despite his charismatic nature usually leading you to overlook it, Griffith from the beginning of Berserk is a very morally great character. He knows what he wants, and he's not afraid to do what he needs to get it. From the beginning, Griffith has a strange aura to him. Interactions like this one, where he tells Guts that he belongs to him, and he will decide where he dies, can easily be written off, but knowing what we know from the future that we see in the Black Swordsman arc, it takes on an almost eerie tone to it. In addition to this, a common theme in Griffith's conquest is that he, on more than one occasion, will use sex to get what he wants out of people. and. Sure, one of those people is an older king, and it could be argued that Griffith was just doing what he needed to gain funding for the Band of the Hawk, but one of those people is also a young and naive princess. That last example in specific felt like borderline sexual assault, and despite the feelings that Princess Charlotte may have for Griffith, when you know his motivations behind supposedly returning those feelings, it really just makes your stomach twist. As would become even more apparent during the events of the Eclipse and the closing of the Golden Age arc, Griffith has no fear in taking what he wants to get where he wants to be, and this only becomes more apparent until Guts' departure from the Hawks leads everything to a boiling point, and alongside his escapades with Princess Charlotte, everything would come crashing down. Darkness. So pure, not a single ray of light can find its way to me. How long have I soaked in this darkness? Eternity? Though at times I think just a moment. I feel nothing. As though there were nothing. And I am floating in it. For his previously mentioned sexual encounter with Princess Charlotte, Griffith is locked up by her father, the King of Midland, and is tortured and beaten beyond recognition. After the one-year time skip when Guts returns to find that he is gone, and by the time that he and the remaining band of the Hawk go to rescue their leader, when they finally recover Griffith, he is unrecognizable from the guardian angel that they knew before. He's barely alive, has his tongue cut out, and has attendants cut in his arms and legs so he cannot even perform basic tasks like walking on his own. The once immensely skilled and radiantly beautiful leader of the band of the Hawk, who has been built up this entire story as someone to look up to is stripped of everything that he once was. Reading these initial scenes with Griffith's return is jarring, to say the least. Someone who has been built up for so long is something to look up to, someone who gave the band of the Hawk something to live and fight for, someone who had a dream that he'd give anything to accomplish, and now it's slipped out of his fingers. But there was one way to get it back. Shortly after recovering Griffith, in one of the most chilling and almost beautiful scenes I've ever read in manga, Berserk experiences its eclipse, where Griffith uses his behelet necklace to summon the four members of the God Hand, a group of powerful demons, and is given the option to sacrifice everyone in the Band of the Hawk in exchange for the power to achieve his goals and a spot as a new member of the God Hand. Guts and everyone in the band look on as Griffith, blinded by power and his current low, accepts the offer, sacrificing everyone who helped him to get where he is now for the sake of his own power, and it feels Strangely fitting, Griffith has a scene before he accepts the offer where he has a vision of himself as a child, struggling with the fact that to achieve his goals he must walk upon the dead bodies of those who care about him in his dream. The path to his goals to achieving his own kingdom like he wanted is paved with the dead bodies of those from the Band of the Hawk, and Griffith understands this. 
Everyone in the band understands it, so why is this time any different? Why is Griffith sacrificing people one final time any different from every other time he sent them into battle knowing that they might die for his cause? I think the reason why it feels like such a betrayal this time is because every other time it was by their own choice. It was people who believed in Griffith's dream and ideology fighting for him by their own volition, but this time they had their lives taken from them. If you haven't read it, Sacrifice in Berserk, at least with the god hand, works a little bit differently than what you probably think when I say the word sacrifice. In Berserk, when someone is sacrificed to the god hand, they are branded somewhere on their body, and that brand basically just attracts evil spirits until that person finally dies. Not only did Griffith give the lives of his people for power, but he guaranteed that they would die a painful and gruesome death in front of each other for his own benefit. Despite the chilling feeling that comes with watching all of these characters that you've come to love, and who you know have devoted themselves to Griffith and his dreams struggle and die confused and painful deaths, I think that nothing holds a candle to the scene that would come after that. And again, another warning, the following section will discuss themes of sexual assault. After emerging from his cocoon, he leaves Griffith behind and is given the name Femto, becoming the fifth member of the God Hand. Griffith emerges, and then commits the act that I think makes him completely irredeemable as a character. After coming out of his transformation, with only Guts and Casco remaining alive, in front of Guts, who had recently been able to develop a romantic and intimate relationship with her, her being the first person that he's been able to do that with since being sexually abused as a child, Griffith sexually assaults Casca in what is the most demeaning and horrifying scene yet. Not only for our protagonist Guts, who is forced to watch and not do anything about it as his arm is stuck in some sort of beast, but for Casca. Casca is a character who has shown time and time again that despite her being a woman in a time where being a woman and a soldier is unheard of, to possess skill and leadership qualities only rivaled by that of Guts and Griffith. She has shown time and time again to be strong, confident, and competent as a leader, only to be left helpless in front of someone who she so deeply respects by the person who she's looked up to for her entire life. Her only words during the scene is telling Guts not to look at her. The man who saves her from the very same situation as a child is ultimately the one to push the trauma onto her as an adult in what is up to this point Berserk's most completely revolting and deeply upsetting scene. This scene, in the same way as the branding of his comrades, was an example of Griffith using people for his benefit without even giving them anything close to a choice, which I believe is where he finally crosses the line of irredeemable. Like I discussed before, it's nothing new for Griffith to use sex to get what he wants out of someone, but this scene is just the biggest spit in the face of Casca and Guts' characters, after both of them have looked up to and worked so hard to fight alongside and become equals with him, and after you as the reader have become so deeply attached to him in the band of the Hawk, you're left feeling simply disgusted and betrayed. Everything Miura has done to set up Griffith as a pillar to look up to, as a person to give direction and a person to give purpose, all comes crashing down in the most heartbreaking and revolting way possible. It's this betrayed attachment to these characters that I think is exactly what Mira intended for when he planned out Griffith's character arc, and it's the completely revolting and upsetting nature of his betrayal due to how his character was set up from the beginning that is what I think makes Griffith to be such a brilliantly written antagonist. As Guts missing one arm and an eye and Casca missing her memories and reverting to a childlike state, assumedly due to the trauma of what happened during the eclipse, are both forced to move forward with their lives without those around them who they previously cared about, I'm excited to see the direction that their story takes from here. The storm is over, but now both Guts and Casca are forced to live with the scars that they've gained from the eclipse, be them physical or mental, and as Guts leaves in search of revenge, what will go down as one of the most well set up and beautifully destroyed arcs in manga history comes to a close. Yo, hi, it's me. Um, I just wanted to record a little little thing at the end of this to say thank you for watching. I'm having a lot of fun making these videos. I, you know, I like to talk about shit that I read, and I think it's, you know, it's interesting to take a little bit of a deeper dive into it, and, uh, uh you know, it, it's, it's, I'm doing it more for myself than anything else, I'm not expecting these to go too far, but the reception that it has received so far is good, uh, my first chance on my video just broke 100 views a few days ago, which, I'm pretty hyped about that, because, you know, I, I put a lot of work into these videos, so it's cool that they're, they're getting to some people at least, um, but yeah, no, I, I really enjoyed these first two arcs, and, and, I think it's unfortunate the way the series had to end, but I'm really excited to see where Berserk goes from here. So, if you have anything that you recommend I read, leave it in the comments. Uh, and, and yeah, I hope you enjoyed, and I'll see you guys later. Bye bye